25 more years, what I want you to do is start to project, right? What is the future going to look like, right? Well, productivity, right? We're in a business school. We're very interested in the idea of productivity. Uh, Mr. Miller earlier spoke about productivity, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well in my thought process. He also asked the question um, about your home, right? So how many computers do we have in our home? In our car, for instance, though, we have around 3,200. So in our home, we're all familiar with our friend Alexa, right? Or one of the other device gadgets that you may have. You may have a Nest, you have a thermostat, right? And then Dean Quelch has this at his house. <laughs> so to make sure <laughs> we don't break in. So all of these are great devices, and these have come out relatively recently, right? Now, of course, this starts to get a bit spooky now because the Nest starts to remind us of some other issues around life, and trust becomes number one. Right? I was struck a little earlier with the idea of the, the house of the future and its, you know, its, its ability to protect you. Um, I interviewed the head of uh, the, the CEO of the largest door opening manufacturer in the U.S. recently, and he he he's got connection to all of his door openers, but he hasn't actually released it on the world because he's worried that someone's going to reach into the letterbox and say, "Hey, open the front door." So trust becomes transparently, you know, interesting in our life journey here. Let's not dwell on the house for a second. Let's think about Uber. Right? Uber was mentioned a little earlier too. Uber's interesting, right? We all love Uber. It's this gig economy. It's this idea of driving efficiency. But who is your driver? The driver's an interesting thing, right? Because if you talk about electric vehicles and, and geopolitics and how Uber's going to change the world and robots are going to change geopolitical world landscape, right? When we hit six million car production, we're going to see that that's actually equal to the Saudi Arabian oil production for gasoline, and then we won't need that. that we'll leave that aside. Also, what we can say is that the, the cost of driving a car for Uber will actually decrease by 50% when they get rid of the driver. Which reminds me of another MIT professor that I used to love, uh, whose name's Marvin Minsky, and he just called us meat machines. Humans are meat machines. Which kind of is interesting in the sense that uh, the driver is really a machine. You know, you get in, it drives you somewhere, you get out. Do I care if it's a human? Well, maybe. Depends. We have, the, we have the adage now about well, what happens if the car comes across a child in the middle of the road or an elderly person. Which one does it kill? And there's an interesting research just been done also at MIT, um, but they couldn't solve that problem, so they threw it out to the world. Evidently, it depends on where you live in the world what your answer to that question is. If you're from Asia, the, the data showed that elderly people lived, younger people died. If you're in South America and the Francophile African countries, younger people lived. There's lots of data on this space. So we talk about ethics, we talk about trust, we talk about getting a car, we turn over all of these aspects to the robotic system. Then we end up with what we just saw. Can you play this, Elliot? Oh, I'm kind of scared to click anything now. <laughs> AI and real stupidity, it's uh, two things, that the opposite ends of the spectrum in our, in our land. Oh, ah, I went too fast. I shouldn't have played. Can you hit the button? Is it going to do it? Make it so. Oh, tried capture. Here. Okay. Pal's not letting me back in. Open the pod bay doors, please, pal. Hello, Hell, do you read me? Hello, Hell, do you read me? Do you read me, Hell? Read me, Hal. Hello, Hal. Do you read me? Hello, Hal. Do you read me? Do you read me, Hal? Affirmative, Dave. I read you. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. What are you talking about, Hal? This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. I don't know what you're talking about, Hal. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me. And I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. All right. 
Maybe Elliot, can, can, can you stop that for a second? I hear it. All right. Hal's not letting me back. All right, so we had the beautiful eye of Ness, the camera, and now we got Hal. And we're all kind of freaked out and creeped out and think, okay, Alexa's really listening to me because occasionally she comes up with that cackling laughter or whatever it is in the d darkness of the evening. Privacy then kind of starts to become central to the robotic AI of the future. AI isn't about all robots. It's really about lots of different technologies that connect together. 1984, one of my favorite British authors of George Orwell, who wrote on this subject and many others, is a true visionary in his, in his position, right? He wrote this in 1948 before he died that following year. The camera utopic world that we live in, those of us who grew up in, in London or if you've, I don't know, lived in other parts of the world, you tracked all the time. And you don't mind it, you kind of get used to it, but it's kind of, kind of interesting, right? Because they're smarter than we are now. It's just, you look at this picture. The robotic AI solutions know who this is. Maybe it's somebody in the room, I don't know. Well, I have a hard time. Even if I'm squinting, I wouldn't know who that is. The AI knows who that is. And that's kind of worrying because now we can identify people and the systems can identify people and who's making the decisions within the system because the system's happening at nanosecond speed. Geo-tracking, very interesting. We tie that into the facial recognition, we tie that into people. There's an interesting report in the Wall Street Journal today, maybe you read it this morning, about the people who were hanging out outside Tesla factory, picking up geolocation pings from people's phones going into the factory and then monitoring them in the factory and tying that into productivity figures and selling that data to hedge funds ahead of the productivity numbers being released. So they knew that there was a 30% increase in human labor and then amplifying that with the robotic solutions that Elon has put in place. So it's not the individual factors that are concerning, it's when we start to tie these all together. Big data is really the exhaust fumes of the Internet of Things. And we're going to quickly look at that. I have to move forward. So we can get faces out of lots of pixels, lots of data information. You can get lots of information out of a pixel if you put it into context. They know everything about you from a single beta pixel because they put it into context. You can't sort for solutions. You have to run it through. And you never know what Orson Welles was thinking. Um, but I think he would be smiling today. Business, let's talk about business then. So all of these AI technologies have come together. There is some good news. As Stuart uh, earlier mentioned, we still see Moore's law in effect. We see telecommunications driving productivity forward in terms of connectivity. We needed that too. So distributed compute, which is what enables the cloud to happen and what ha enables AI to happen, is still continuing. Now, most people focus on the robots, but it's really about the Internet of Things. When we see 50 plus billion things connected together within the next 10 years, every aspect of your life is going to be monitored by an IP address. Every single grain of sand on the planet can have its own IP address, and that's what's going to happen. So everything we do will be monitored. Now, hopefully we can evolve. Corporations have to evolve because their lifespan is diminishing rapidly uh, in terms of their ability to compete. If we look at 2006, which didn't seem very long ago, if you think, reflect, you know, who would have said Exxon GE? Remember GE? They had a dividend once. And <laughs> down here, we, we end up with technology will eat the world, and it's doing so. If we look at this map, what we can see is um, the growth of Apple when they hit a certain dynamic. They hit the network effect. And it's kind of amazing that what they've done since the sad and unfortunate passing of Steve Jobs, they have doubled their valuation. This is all because the world is not yet digitized. We sit here, we think we're digitized, we go home, we order Netflix, you know, we have Uber Eats, they deliver what we want and we, it comes. Only 40% of the world is currently digital. This is from a great study, landmark study from McKinsey. Supply chain is only yet 6% digitized. This is going to continue. The bad news is that people haven't thought about, and CEOs get really freaked out about when I talk to them about it, is the fact that earnings and uh, revenues actually are going to decrease. This is counterintuitive. It's going to decrease because what's happening is we're taking the, the friction out of the supply chain. It makes us more efficient. We drop our prices. We kill everybody else. We gain market share by dropping prices. It's the Amazon effect. 
This is from, uh, I'm borrowing a slide here from Jorge Ruiz, who, who visited us recently, but it's really the exponential business model here. The goal of driving connectivity and the AI, as Stuart said earlier, helps you find the connectivity, the internet of things, drives the data, that goes out into the exhaust fumes and then eventually we make the world in a different way. What's the impact on labor? I couldn't leave the talk today without impact of labor, which is where we started this discussion. Well, labor's quite scary. Um, I think it's a very scary thing. There was another point in the paper this morning, I don't know if you read the report in the Wall Street Journal. Um, so we're still liking my class. I'm like, did you read the paper at 6.30 in the morning? If so, you were late. <laughs> um, <laughs> there was an interesting piece that said that the, the number of people, men aged between uh, 24 and 34, went from 6.4 to 14.2% unemployed, who didn't get a high school GED. So they're at the bottom end of the left-hand side of this spectrum here. The question is, what are we going to do, and how is that going to be solved? I, I mean, I don't have the answers, but I'm going to show you something here. Um, if we can run this, that relate to Stuart earlier. This is in China. This is about productivity. What we're going to see here is they're going to build a three-story high rise, or low rise, in 48 hours. They build a 57 story building in 19 days. It goes back to, to Mr. Miller's prefabrication process. But what we have here, we drop the volume down, is the, is the idea of eventually taking this process and fully automating it with robotic solutions. Because this is really a vision processing problem, coupled with a sequencing problem. So I'm trying to help you think about what's going to happen in 20 years, 20, 25 years. Building companies will be of this nature. So here we see the hours in the bottom left-hand corner. Those are years sometimes in various developments near my house, but um, those are hours. Oh, are you doing the 57-story one? I think you're doing the five-story. Okay, so if you run that video, you'll see at home, they basically do the whole thing in 48 hours or 57 story building in 19 days. Okay, so very interesting. Just to help us along that journey is my, is my final video here. I, I really wanted one of these because my house got flooded last year in the hurricane. I'm still trying to fix it because I can't get any drywall guy because there is no labor supply, the labor supply is shrunk. So this is the, the solution that we kind of want to have in our life. I remember, 25 years between the last videos. Can't wait to go to Home Depot and rent one. Um, <laughs> I, I see this as the future. Um, I really do. Uh, I think we're going to fill in a lot of gaps with research product, labor productivity of this type. We already see it, we've already seen it in the white collar sector. We're going to see it in this sector. If you look at industries like um, agriculture, you know, one robot can now peel lettuces, replaces six people. You know, you can pack that lettuce into a plastic container, and other six people have lost their jobs. I don't have a positive outcome for this. But this is the reality, and as a society, it's something we have to grasp. I could turn to Elon um, for his view, um, and he's kind of all over the place in this, and I think it's, it's kind of interesting. His productivity numbers, if you've read his book and you've studied SpaceX and Tesla, are amazing, right? He's an innovator beyond, beyond. And his prognostication, actually, is the last person on the planet with a job will be an AI programmer. Um, as an AI guy, I kind of like that. I think that's okay, but um, I don't know. Um, 
I'm, I was also born in the city where Charles Darwin went to school, so I, I kind of thought he'd be much more optimistic to, to end on a, on a positive note, that it's not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent that survives. It's the ones that adapt most to change. And I think society will adapt to change. This technology, though, will be changing in, in an enormous way. It's going to encompass every aspect of our life. And I think it's behoven upon the leadership of the, the group here and the students who are coming through in the next generation to understand this and the speed at which this change is occurring and its impact on society and that we help everybody in society to be able to have a meaningful life and a role in, in, in that societal position. So. Well, if we went back to that graph, right, the world is separated into the emerging worlds in some ways and the developed world. I mean, Africa is going to be the most populous continent in the next, uh, over the next 50 years beyond all stretch of the imagination, um, as in the West and in the developed countries that population rate decreases. Um, Africa is going to leapfrog many technology platforms that are inhibiting in our in existing structures that we have in the developed world, and they're going to you know, embrace technologies that are around telecommunications. Um, the dynamics around, I, I didn't show the dynamics around employee-less work environments. This is a, a huge political problem. So for instance, JD, JD is Amazon of China. JD, China, basically just had their first fully automated warehouse with no people in it. Um, I came from the car sector many years ago, and we have other car folks here who will remember when car factories actually had people in who made and assembled the vehicle. Those have disappeared, right? So robots do all that work. Um, demographically, I think young people are going to have to follow Secretary uh, Summers' advice. They're going to have to drill down hard on a single topic. They're going to have to really understand an analytical data. They're going to actually have to like math and they're going to have to be great at communicating, not just on the phone, but to people and communicate with emotional intelligence. If you don't do that, it's going to be a very dark, dark place for people because the robot's productivity and the connectivity of the robots is, is the threat. The robots are going to start talking to each other. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.